and we are on the hour. So let's go ahead and get our session started. I'm uh, Bill Westcott. I'll be uh, moderating the session on the circular economy and thinking about the, uh, the big objective of how do we decouple prosperity from, from consumption. Uh, there are so many parts of the world for so many decades that we have made the consumption of goods and energy uh, equivalent to prosperity, uh, and that happens not to be the case. And circular economy is, is a way to understand how we can meaningfully decouple that uh, so we have uh, both uh, prosperity um, equality and uh, fewer environmental uh, in impacts as well as fewer costs. I am delighted to have an amazing panel with me today representing experience from around the world uh, and across uh, many years, uh, although I, I can probably claim to be the, the old guy in the group. <laughs> uh, and um, so we're going to have a, a great discussion and we invite all of your comments, so please feel free to Put your uh, comments and questions uh, in uh, the uh, the chat there. And thank you, Ananda, for for starting that off. Um, and what I'll first do is kind of give my take on on circular economy, and then uh, we'll uh, hand it off to each of our panelists uh, to give uh, their takes. Um, and also, we'll we'll see how uh, people come into our, our virtual uh, room here. Uh, hopefully, uh, people will be excited about this as we are. So, from my my point of view, uh, circular economy is something I'm deeply passionate about. I've been working on for decades, starting off with uh, an, a waste minimization offering at Arthur D. Little that I, I started in the late '80s, uh, working with uh, states in the United States around recycling programs. Uh, working with corporates around their recycling programs, particularly around plastics, uh, moving into industrial ecology. And finally, I think we're in an era in which we have the technology in terms of uh, information technology, AI, machine learning, image processing, understanding the, the location and the state of goods across the spectrum from consumers as well as industrial areas. And we have the technology to understand uh, how to design materials and products better uh, and think about the entire life cycle of products. We also have some really positive experiences uh, in adjacent areas, I would say, such as in climate, where we can uh, learn from how uh, we have been able to engage policymakers and the general public um, and link what we're doing in the circular economy to those very important goals uh, of reducing climate impact. So I like to say the circular economy is the free lunch for climate, where we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by some 20% at very modest cost. And in many cases, it's profitable. So what I like to do is first start off with David McGinty, who's the global director of PACE, the platform for accelerating the circular economy in the Netherlands. Uh, this is the, the watering hole for many of the key players around the world uh, in public and private sector. And uh, David, I'd like you to uh, help us uh, understand a little bit better uh, what the landscape is uh, as you see it. Who are the key players and uh, what's on their agenda? Sure. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And I think we've got an intimate group, so I'll keep my comments intimate as well. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll just hit four things on... A little bit on each on where we are or wh how we got here and where we can go a little bit in the future on how the agenda is going overall, where we're moving in materials and industries, the impacts we're looking at, and some of these kind of cross-cutting issues that are bubbling up. So one is I, I always like to preface these conversations with this circular economy is not a European agenda. There is a history and legacy in Europe. There is also a history and legacy in Japan in China and even before the 1970s and the Club of Rome, the limits of growth, there was already work in industrial symbiosis and regenerative agriculture. So there's a long legacy we build off of. So sometimes we can get caught up and go, this circular economy momentum is, is new and urgent. It's been urgent for 40 years. The theories and the approaches and the fundamentals have been there. We just haven't applied them at scale. And so that's the positive part of this story. The, the tools are there, the business 
thinking is there. It just needs to be applied, especially in a, a digitized world. And one thing I like to reflect back on is I've, I've been reading a little bit of the history on the SDGs just to kind of refresh myself. I was young in my career or mid in my career. When the SDGs were out, I started working with the, the pre-SDG world. Um, and how SDG 12, Sustainable Consumption and Production, came about being, how did that become an SDG? One of the clear things that came out was it was a difficult negotiation. And it was the tension between high consuming countries' obligations to check their own consumption while supporting other countries have a sustainable and healthy amount of growth and industrialization that, that created some more equity in the world. So underlying SDG 12 is even a discussion of North, South, East, West, developed LMIC country, balance is an equity. Uh, and that means economic equity and, and, and other issues. So it's always kind of fun to remember that legacy that we, we confront when we look at the challenges and, and how we approach things. And the other on kind of how the global agenda is working is that I would say there's real globalization. So um, right now, in the last two years, there have been launched initiatives in Africa, in Latin America, with coalitions of governments bringing in the private sector. So governments taking the lead to set policies and start to standardize on, and define what circular economy means in their context and for their, their, their economies and their environments as well as a growing amount of, of continued uh, work in Japan and China and other individual countries. On the second point on materials, in the, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of work on business models. Specifically, you can look at certain materials like plastics and even more specifically, when you look into each material like plastic packaging, lots of work in that area. And what we're starting to see is a move to more complex products and industries. So circularity in consumer electronics, batteries, textiles, and what's really emerging and more complicated, but big problems or big opportunities, is a move to systems. So what does circularity for food systems mean? Circularity for the built environment, circularity for transportation. This is only just beginning. So we're kind of at that exciting point where it's going to get more complicated, but that's where we're going to unlock things like climate impacts. So to, so to turn to the, the impact, Again, the past 10 years, a lot of discussion on the economic and business opportunity in the last couple of years, more links to the environment and climate, namely emissions, so CO2 emissions reduction. Um, and you can see that in, for example, the theme of the World Circular Economy Forum uh, that just happened in April, focused on the link between circularity and climate. And what's emerging is that shift beyond, you know, to kind of go deep on the resource use and efficiency mechanism. So let's say you're looking at a, an emissions perspective of the world. You would say process emissions. How can circularity help us go beyond process emissions and go to the more systemic, deeper cuts that would come out of, say, shifts in consumption patterns? Um, and that's that's really kind of where you see this move uh, going, especially on the policymaker side, thinking about how they're going to use circularity. And just finally, a couple of points that because of the shift from materials to industries and systems and looking at impact, there are some critical cross-cutting barriers and opportunities, depending on your perspective uh, of the day, um, that we really have to remove in order to enable true circularity. Uh, so trade in secondary materials has to work better. Uh, we've got to look at decent work and equity. That's the same with any type of transformation. Uh, and shifts in supply chains and markets. And so decent work is really bubbling up as countries put these practices in place and companies put them in place. And, and then finally, uh, the turn to the great uh, elephant often in the room beyond consumption is tax and incentives. And, and the conversation has been going on for a long time on tax in little niche areas, but uh, those tax customs and incentives are really gonna pop up. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks, David. That that's very helpful. Um, and uh, in fact, um, the SDGs, as you know, were, were, were birthed at the Rio Plus Twenty, which was chaired by uh, I will claim him as well. Our former French Environment Minister Brice Lalonde, uh, who's a fantastic person. Uh, and um, there's a there's a funny story we can tell at some point about actually how SDGs came uh, to be after the uh, Millennium Development Goals uh, were um, kind of being phased out. So. Laurent, 
Um, we've had the pleasure of working at, at Veolia for a number of years. Uh, you've been a corporate uh, leader. Uh, and one of the things I like about everybody actually on this panel is uh, deep international experience. Uh, and uh, you've lived in, in Asia, uh, Europe, US, uh, everywhere. So you have a global view. Uh, and now you're planting your flag as an entrepreneur uh, in the circular economy space. Tell us more about why you decided to do that and your journey. Yes, thank you, Bill. And uh, I understand you, you, you were missing a bit of French accent, so happy to uh, provide you with that. Um, yes, well, circular, I would echo, I mean, a few things that David have said, obviously. Um, yes, circular economy is not new, but uh, really, let's say in the past 10 years, um, you know, we've been really uh, working on it. I remember the early days in uh, in, uh, in Davos uh, with uh, Ellen MacArthur and, and others uh, before it became now really um, mainstream. You know, at least the concept is, it became mainstream. Uh, the issue is still basically to bring it to scale, uh, as David said. And um, I'd like to talk about plastics, uh, you know, to start with, um, obviously because... Uh, you know, plastics in, um, is a winning material, you know, one of the, the third, uh, I mean, the, the three um, uh, largest uh, amount of material being used is, uh, is plastics. Uh, obviously, also because plastics emerged in the past several years as a major pollution, uh, the awareness of the impact on the ocean, for instance, you know, really uh, took off. Uh, but also because I believe that plastics is the opportunity to um, to create actually the the first um, circular economy example at scale, um, and uh, with all the benefits uh, from uh, an environmental perspective, from a social perspective, and obviously uh, from a business perspective as well. Uh, this is something that uh, for me is taking place. Um, of course, we want to think beyond Europe and the impact and the plastic crisis is not in Europe, but it's true that uh, we've got now a bit of the, the perfect storm, I would say, in Europe uh, that uh, will enable really to uh, start deploying, you know, the, the circular economy of plastic at scale. Uh, regulation have evolved a lot uh, in terms of uh, putting targets, namely, uh, David mentioned uh, packaging, plastic packaging. Um, so including uh, recycled um, plastic into the packaging. Uh, system had been put in place for quite many years, uh, the extended producer responsibility, namely to help to finance collection, sorting, and hopefully recycling. But really the objective to, to include uh, recycled plastic in packaging, um, you know, is set now in Europe. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, the regulation have moved but uh, infrastructure are not in place yet, not at scale as needed. And this is leading to an acceleration. Um, just uh, last week, actually, um, a group uh, called Plastic Europe was announcing that um, they would invest uh, more than 7 billion euros by 2030 um, to um, put in place the infrastructure to enable uh, the chemical recycling of, uh, of plastic packaging. Um, if you look at uh, all the means of, um, of recycling, more traditional one, uh, the, the mechanical recycling, namely for, uh, for resin called uh, you know, PET, um, uh, we're talking about a 2.5 billion euro business um, you know, by 2025 in, in Europe. Um, and so that creates the opportunity for a number of entrepreneurs uh, to invest. Uh, and this is what we are starting to do with um, Venture Represent uh, Secular Resources. Uh, we're looking at building from scratch uh, a more than 1 billion euro business by 2025, um, investing 1.5 billion euros uh, to build and develop new infrastructure in a way that uh, would be um, integrated vertically. And I would probably come back to that uh, from access to feedstock, which is most likely the, 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 the main bottleneck the collection to uh, actually um, uh, deploying infrastructure and uh, connecting actually the users of, uh, of plastics, the, the brands, um, to, um, you know, to, uh, to, to the recycled material. Starting in Europe, definitely uh, coming to the States and hopefully be able to have an impact at scale 
in uh, emerging economies. I'll pause there, Ben. Great. Yeah. And that, that's certainly a, a, another case of dramatic movement um, in, in popular opinion is ocean plastics into uh, consumerism, uh, single use materials, uh, and then cycling back, as it were, into the circular economy. Um, so again, that, that could be a, a tremendously useful a, experience in, in one's very specific sector. And April, you know all about plastic packaging, having been a senior executive at Coca-Cola before you uh, joined uh, Circulate uh, Capital as a, a co-founder. So why, why, from a pr perspective of an investor, why is this an exciting area to you? Yeah, thanks. Um, again, great to be a part of this discussion. Um, similar to many others um, that are part of this panel, I've been working on this topic for a long time, as you noted, and it is an area where I see lots of opportunities, um, not only from an economic perspective, which is where I'm sitting now, um, but also from an environmental and social perspective. And has already, um, it's already been noted by um, the two previous panelists that this circular economy concept is not new. But um, as I think about, you know, the past 10 to 15 years, it was um, when we started to talk about the economic potential of moving to a more circular economy. So it was referenced the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in a report that they released that really brought new energy to a concept, as David noted, that has been around for decades. And looking at it from how we can um, move from a linear economy where trillions of dollars worth of materials are lost to landfill or incineration and bringing in the economic lens of how we keep that economic value of those resources in the economy for as long as possible. Um, so in addition to thinking about it from an economic perspective, um, you know, again, you noted that um, we look at it from a climate perspective and how do we connect those messages? Um, there's another set of investors that we can reach um, just by making that connection and the, the data is there to support it, as well as uh, the other topic that's been mentioned around how do we keep materials like plastics out of our oceans? Um, and it's going to take investors of all shapes and sizes really to help support uh, solutions in this space. What we've seen to date, so at Circulate Capital, we're focused right now on a very specific area of the world, which is South and Southeast Asia, and uh, where we know that there's a large percentage of uh, waste that's entering the ocean. And um, we know um, from studies that have conducted that we can reduce the amount of this material, plastics in particular, um, as much as 40% by focusing on building waste management and recycling systems in that area. So we at Circulate Capital, um, through the support, our funders to date are all um, large brand owners, um, Coca-Cola, uh, Unilever, PepsiCo, um, and companies like Dow, who have provided funding and not in a philanthropic way. We are committed to be able to demonstrate that um, there are investable solutions um, that can help support and bring other investors, the concept of catalytic capital, of being able to demonstrate that these are spaces where you can get a return. Um, and so that's our focus um, right now through, through this work. So excited to engage more with the discussion. Uh, it's great to see the um, engagement already um, through some of the comments and look forward to connecting with everyone. Great. Well, thanks, April. And you, you mentioned uh, that the new word, trillions. Trillions is like the new billion, right? Uh, and we're you know, spending trillions here and there. Uh, and the reality is, again, as you're saying, circular economy is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Uh, and it's, I think, a little better documented in, in the EU. In fact, um, there's an OECD report saying this could raise the uh, GDP by, um, you know, point one to 0.5 percent, uh, which again is in the trillions of, of dollars uh, uh, area, as well as increase uh, green jobs uh, and overall employment by about 0.3 percent. So that still moves the needle when you talk about you know, large uh, population sets. Uh, and even the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, at least their foundation, uh, says that they think uh, it's going to be about a trillion dollar per year opportunity in the United States. Uh, so Shannon, you have tons of experience, uh, both from 
your prior work in McKinsey and your current leadership at McKinsey.org. Uh, we have all these things going for us. We're saving the planet, we're saving materials, we're saving money, we're creating jobs. What's not to like about circular economy? What could go wrong and what do we need to make sure it goes right? Uh, Bill, thank you for, uh, for having me on the panel. It's great to be with this group of people. Um, as uh, David and April and Laurent have all suggested in their presentations, there are significant opportunities for a lot of different players in the circular economy. Um, and this is, uh, this is but, it, what, but getting it right is going to be really important in terms of capturing that social impact, right, as we, as we expand. Um, so you gave some numbers. I have other numbers. So, for example, UN International Resource Panel has reported that using resources effectively could increase the size of the global economy by 2 trillion by 2050. International Labor Organization projects a net creation of 18 million green jobs globally by 2030, which uh, could be many of which will be circularity related jobs. Um, and a report by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation projects that by 2030, the European GDP could increase from 4% under the current development scenarios to 11% under um, a circular economy development pathway. So clearly, there's really significant potential for social benefit based on the economics and job creation. But that's a lot of high level numbers, right? So if I look specifically at one piece of that circularity puzzle, the recovery of materials through the recycling, um, which is an area where we at McKinsey.org and our Rethinking Recycling program is focused, I can perhaps add a bit more color to how this could play out. Um, so maybe first just a brief introduction of our program so you know where my examples are coming from. Uh, the Rethinking Recycling program takes a two-pronged approach to building integrated waste management and recycling systems in the global south. We start by working on the supply side, which as Laurent suggested is the true bottleneck, especially in emerging economies, um, to build self-sustaining community-owned recycling programs that cre create a reliable stream of high value waste. We then also work on the demand side with corporate players to ensure large enough local markets to reliably absorb the supply of all that recycled material at a fair price on an ongoing basis so that those systems that we're setting up don't go through this boom bust cycle that has traditionally happened with the recycling. Um, and today we're working in Argentina and Indonesia with a goal to scale nationally and globally. So if we look back at that social impact opportunity, uh, it's hard to find really concrete numbers in the recycling space, but one study in Florida found that a 1% increase in a state's recycling rate leads to a 0.4% increase in direct circular jobs. Um, and we've certainly seen this in our programs. As we've trained, upskilled, um, and uh, create new jobs, um, we've actually been able to touch over 500 workers in just the last two and a half years. Um, and it, but it's not just about creating good jobs, it's about capturing the social impact so that we can ensure uh, access to fair wages and working conditions. So it's about creating good jobs. Um, so we know that today, approximately 20 million people are making their livings through informal recycling in the Global South. These are hard, often unsafe jobs, uh, and one study found that the average life expectancy of a waste worker is about half of that of a non-waste worker in the same socioeconomic situation in the same economy. Um, multiple case studies show that when waste picker jobs are formalized, the quality of life, salaries, and health improves. And we see this in our program too. In Argentina, our program has added uh, 5 to 10 percent to the salaries of waste workers. And in, Dine in Indonesia, waste worker salaries have increased 200 to 300 percent while also gaining them access to healthcare and social benefits. So how do we capture these opportunities as we go forward? Um, this, uh, the, the, the cardinal rule as we think about how to translate these uh, circular economy solutions into emerging economies is to co-create solu solutions with local as well as global stakeholders. So co-creating with local stakeholders will help ensure that we are inclusive of the most disadvantaged people. Um, to give an example, again, from my recycling space, waste workers are a marginalized fraction of essential workers, and among them, women are the most disadvantaged. Most female waste workers are paid less than men, and they face more complex struggles around health and safety. But when we speak with them, we learn that many uh, have serious aspects of their jobs that they deeply value, especially the flexibility to work when they want so that they can manage childcare 
responsibilities, for example. Um, and we see this in both Indonesia and Argentina, where 90% of the workers in our programs are women, many with young children. So by incorporating their voice into the design of the solution, we can ensure not only that we meet their specific needs in the design of the solution, but also, um, and those are needs that often have excluded them from other formal work situations, but also that the programs are more stable with a better chance of sticking uh, over time. Um, it's also important to include national and global stakeholders. So this will ensure that we think through the systems level implications and that we aren't designing solutions that are individually collect, correct and collectively wrong, um, which would ultimately lead to solving the wrong problem or slowing down progress uh, towards the right end state. And finally, financing will be needed. Um, emerging economies to transition to circularity will need um, not just in recycling, uh, but also in manufacturing, design, education, um, well, they will need extra support. So none of this is rocket science, this transition to the circular economy. The ideas have been around for a long time, as all the panelists have said, but it will require education, capability building, and an eye to inclusivity to make sure that we maximize capture of the social impact benefits, along with the environmental and economic benefits that circularity can bring. Great. That's that's really helpful way to, to frame and understand it. And um, uh, certainly in the past, even some of our quote unquote successes in things like recycling have been literally literally on the backs of those who could you know, least afford to bear that that burden. Uh, and many of the folks uh, in the um, industrialized world weren't, weren't fully aware of that. Uh, so as, as uh, we progress and, and learn more about our, our own planet, um, we uh, become, I think, um, more sensitized to the fact that we need to have equity uh, across the board. Um, and, and certainly when uh, China turned off, turned off uh, the flow uh, and we understood, you know, from many you know, sad experiences in Asia and Africa about, um, you know, sham recycling, um, contaminated waste, uh, you know, garbage barges flying around the world, um, e-waste issues, uh, you know, our, our eyes were opened uh, to the, those important uh, equity considerations. Um, actually, one thing that, that came to mind as you're talking, Shannon, is perhaps we can learn from other uh, commodity markets uh, mm -hmm. that are also labor intensive. So we like, you know, coffee, chocolates, you know, sustainable sourcing, where we have maybe some similarities between uh, communities uh, and and perhaps similar ways we can address it at a global level, again, led by, by brands. Any, any, any quick thought on, on that? Uh, yeah, I feel a little bit like I just planted uh, that question because we wrote a paper a couple of years ago that was published in Green Biz about this, but using okay. agriculture uh, to think about how do you stabilize the price of the recycled material. So things like floor, floor prices, um, uh, pr uh, cost plus pricing, and then also long-term contracts. Uh, so absolutely, I think there are lots of opportunities to, to borrow from other places. Cool. Great. Uh, well, at, at, at some point, if you could maybe uh, uh, put that Green Biz link in the, the chat, uh, that, that'd be great. I, I'd love to read that, that piece. Um, if, I may, we, if I may react, yes, uh, Bill, I mean, yes. just on, on that, I mean, uh, completely agreed with uh, what Shannon just said. I just would want to, to flag something that is uh, probably obvious. Um, you know, a big difference uh, with the ag business there is that, uh, you know, with circular economy, you're talking about uh, creating local economy, yeah. you know, the loops. Uh, we're trying to get them as local as possible in this global world. Uh, but that's the, um, the opportunity, yes, to create uh, better conditions for the poorest, the, the waste pickers. Uh, but also to get investment to be made um, in uh, new infrastructure uh, for recycling in these countries. And that's also an opportunity for developed uh, economies, actually, to, um, to keep the material um, there and, uh, and to develop also for, for them jobs and, uh, and infrastructure. And actually, Ron, there, there's a question in the, in the chat here from uh, Vivek Chabra uh, that I think you'd also uh, uh, be able to address uh, well and, and as, rest, uh, as well as the rest of the panelists, uh, talking about how can we create kind of uh, crowdsourcing uh, to um, uh, make this you know, recycling work. Uh, and I'm thinking about your work, and particularly in, in, in France uh, with, with one of the startups there. 
um, and, and, and using social networks and crowdsourcing to, to, to make this work. And the other thing that came to mind was um, uh, some work that, that Viola was doing in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa uh, of using uh, plastic waste as currency uh, to use uh, public sanitation facilities. Uh, so could you comment on that, please? Yes, um, yes, it's very much about um, the opportunity to, to involve people. And um, as Shannon was saying, uh, you know, the collection is uh, very much a bottleneck, um, especially in countries where you do not have uh, waste management uh, st structure in place. But also, uh, you know, back where I, I am today in France, um, you know, the collection rate is not uh, as high as it should be. Uh, you know, for PET bottle, which is supposed again to be easiest, we only had 55% collection rate. So when we have the objective to uh, recycle 90% plus, uh, there's still a long way to go. So um, obviously consumers um, have got to be demanding in terms of uh, uh, having more recycled content, but also they can be actors. And um, as you know, Bill, uh, through uh, you know this business that you were referring to, We've worked on, uh, um, you know, uh, what I would call voluntary uh, deposit system, where basically you give incentive to people um, to uh, uh, to collect and uh, and to put uh, the, the packaging back into the system, um, and uh, through involvement of other players, uh, you know, this could be brands, this could be uh, retailers, this could be, uh, you know, sports centers, cities, and so forth and so on, basically to help and and contribute uh, to address altogether this um, this challenge uh, while creating actually more links uh, at the local uh, community level. Um, this could be a currency as well, as you were saying, you know, I've worked on connecting that with uh, some program on sanitation. Um, you know, uh, this could be the way actually to bring money into the system because this material has got value uh, because the pressure that there is to, to solve, to help and solve the, the plastic crisis uh, create the opportunity to have uh, uh, money flowing into into the system, and again, this is the opportunity for some of um, this money to spread to help and, and support putting in place some of uh, the critical um, you know uh, systems such as sanitation and recycling. Right, and, and certainly uh, one of the the superpowers that is out there today is. For, for better and sadly for worse, uh, the, the social interaction. And hopefully we can put this to good use. Uh, I, I want to combine two comments and questions uh, uh, in the chat here from Ananda and, and from Slav and direct this to um, uh, David and, and April. Um, the first from, from Slav is talking about, hey, we're, we're talking about recycling here. Circular economy is so much more. And I totally agree. Uh, in fact, one of my big criticisms of circular economy is that in some ways we are kind of enabling the linear economy you know, to con continue on. Uh, and we're just doing the best we can, taking the world still as it is, uh, versus looking at completely d different business models of, of uh, higher capital utilization, uh, selling services rather than goods. And the question is, if my uh, internal combustion car sits 95% of the time unused in my garage or, or in a parking area, does it make a difference if it's an EV or if it's internal combustion? You know, the, the difference may not be, be huge. Why not have that EV be used 95% of the time versus idle? Uh, so I think that that's a, that's a great point of saying, how, how do we move beyond just the recycling conversation into uh, rethinking and, re and actually rediscovering, as everyone has been saying, this is not a new way to, to go about our, our business. This is how most of the people in the world live in resource scarce areas. They need to be thoughtful about it. It's how people have lived you know, for millennia. So uh, I think the question for, for um, and, and Dave, I want to start with you and then follow up with, with April, is how do we get from you know, this uh, um, waste and, and, and material and recycling focus to, to the, the bigger question of um, you know, other circular economy business models? And then to Ananda's uh, point, and, and, and April, if you can kind of follow up with this, is how to make sure that as we go through these amazing new solutions, which again, Amazon it should be like the poster child for this. They've got the data, they've got uh, you know, the, the infrastructure, they're, they're geniuses at logistics. 
they've got the retail flow, they can flip over into a circular economy uh, super easy, arguably, and, but then they, they will accumulate the wealth that, that is generated from the new business models. How, how do we look about uh, look at that from an equitable, uh, equitable uh, perspective? So, David, you and then April, please. Sure. Thanks. I, I think there are a lot of ways to answer those questions, and uh, so uh, I'll try a few. Um, one is we're at a moment where we've got to explain why we want to work on circular economy. You know, having more efficiency just for efficiency's sake might be good for business, might reduce supply chain risk, could increase profitability. Those are all good, perfectly fine things. But that's not necessarily why we can push for systems change. That just might be good business uh, or in the best interest of a certain country for competitive reasons or something. You know, it's a different, different equation. But the, the issue has to be if we just continue having the same amount of throughput and efficiency results in us just consuming more, we're going to be in even worse state than we're already in. And we're already in an unsustainable state. So the, the actual principle, the, the reason to talk about circularity is not about just getting resources and materials back in if we don't actually address the fundamental kind of problem of, of consumption and demand. And one way to do that is, is raising awareness among policymakers, ourselves as consumers, and others. I think there's some other areas, you know, what's the next plastic? Let's think about that. Where And, and plastics you need you needed to get to where we are today, you needed 20, 30, 40 years of overconsumption, then consumer awareness, and you need that combination of policymakers, businesses having a self interest, and then consumers becoming aware of the issue. And we, we need to look at what the next material or products are going to be there. I think it's most likely going to be consumer electronics. We're all sitting in front of a ton of devices. Those aren't going anywhere. We just need to wake up and realize our own consumption and how many phones I've had since iPhones were created. How many smartphones have I had? Or sorry, Blackberries. I started with Blackberries, um, and um, so so I think that's one. And then I just maybe a final point here to that that consumer part is I don't think we so I I don't think I've done a good job in in understanding even for myself what my lifestyle is going to look like in 2050 and that it's going to be good and that i can live a happy healthy life in a world where i consume things differently and less and i like some of the narrative and discussions coming out for example from ikea talking about circular living so if you really looked at the circular home what does my house look like so that we can get in developed countries now an ability to shift and in countries where we have massive growths of middle income populations so the high growth economies middle income countries so that people will start to aspire to that lifestyle as opposed to the lifestyle of you know my myself or or, or others who are living completely unsustainably yeah uh, you know, I'll just add because um, as soon as I saw that comment, um, I found myself guilty because this is one of the areas and um, that I have focused on as well is we have to think beyond recycling and more on what we mean by the circular economy. You know, I think it is a stepping stone. I think somebody else even said something similar in the comments is this is a way to get people to understand a little bit more about the need for more material reuse and not continuing to tap into our virgin resources but to start thinking about how we build things to be more durable or more modular, or as you said, on the um, things um, more as a service um, or leasing of, of, of products and services um, has to happen um, for us to truly really drive the circularity piece. Um, for us at Circulate Capital, we, were, we are focused on a specific issue around plastics in the ocean and showing um, how recycling and circular economy systems are an investable space and uh, near term we need to stop that flow um, which is why we've focused a lot on the recycling and waste management systems but at the same time we are looking for where are those innovative solutions that help us leapfrog and technologies um, to help particularly in developing and emerging markets um, and the other key piece in addition to um, what david said around policies 
uh, and governments really helping incentivize um, a lens towards a more circular economy. It really takes uh, collective um, industry collaboration and partnership with that. I think about it, even if we look at how some of the recycling systems and materials and value um, developed over the past few decades, it was when you know, pre-competitive industry groups were able to sit down and do design work together to make that happen. I think, you know, if we want to think about how, whether it's the next generation delivery system for beverages or for toothpaste and deodorant, you know, pick whatever type of um, product or service you want to um, help direct, it has to be done in that systems approach in a very collaborative way. And, um, you know, I think we're seeing more of those types of collaborations come together, but it has to be, um, you know, there's not a silver bullet for this, um, but really looking at how we can bring all of those parties together and really incentivize uh, the, this direction more. And April, do you have, do you have any thoughts on, uh, I think one, one of the, the issues that at least I think has been implicit in the comment was how, how do we think about uh, uh, success? And, and one of the implications is that we may have continued concentration of wealth in the industrialized world. Um, because this is where a lot of innovation is coming from. Uh, and also the LPs, the, the limited partners who are investing in, in funds such, such as yourself, you know, that's, that's great. Um, but again, again, they're going to probably skew more towards, um, you know, industrialized world. Any, any thoughts on, on, on that in terms of, of the, the, the wealth gap? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the work that um, Shannon and her team um, have done in this space um, is key in just helping educate around that space. Um, I think, you know, if we think about this being very European centric to date, um, we have a lot of great examples of where we are seeing, you know, frameworks put together um, in developing and emerging markets to help support this. And we know that you, know, we, you can get economic growth and job creation um, through that. So the more we can do to support inclusive systems um, to help um, advance this and encourage the policy and frameworks that do that, um, the more we can hopefully close that divide a little bit. Great. And, and Shannon, do you, do you have thoughts on the, the wealth gap as well? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I just echoing what um, what April was saying, I think that there's a real opportunity to think through how these models can actually help to close that wealth gap, right? So um, it, it was interesting, we were having a conversation uh, recently with a government who was recognizing that building a landfill put a lot of economic development in one place, in one community. But if you actually build recycling systems, especially community owned recycling systems, you're spreading that economic development across a much larger part, portion of the community and a larger area. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for this type of thing that helps uh, to helps to spread that wealth as well. Great. And since we're coming at the end of our time, um, I'd like to ask each of you just give maybe a, a quick uh, takeaway that you'd like uh, the audience uh, here and the future audience of our reporting uh, to, to uh, take away from this conversation. So I'd like to start with you, Shannon. Um, okay, well, so I guess the, the big takeaway for me is, uh, and given the position I'm playing on this panel today, <laughs> um, is to aim for social impact and to increase the social impact of the sustainable of, of the uh, circular economy solutions that we're finding. So, um, and that, and to, to the uh, opening comments that I made, really understanding the stakeholders and decision making makers on the ground, rather than cutting and pasting uh, solutions from other economies into those. Uh, emerging economies, I think is really critical. And April, what's your, what's your takeaway? Yeah, I think, you know, with this, just trying to keep in mind that while this is an environmental problem that we need to solve, um, it's really an economic opportunity um, as an opportunity for us to seize. Yeah. Right. And uh, Laurent, uh, and I actually, I, I should probably call this a giveaway rather than a takeaway. <laughs> well, um, you know, we're talking about the system, systemic change. And, um, you know, achieving uh, such a change requires making the first concrete, visible, sizable steps. And that's where, um, yes, the economy is much bigger than just recycling. But that's where I believe that uh, what's happening now around plastics is a unique opportunity, actually, to make this first step and uh, demonstrate that it is feasible, it is impactful, and 
we can then bring it to other uh, topics. Great. And, and David, what, what's the, 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 the takeaway that you want people to have from this conversation? And, and I, I see David has actually posted a, a link in, in the comments. Um, and David, if you can access your audio um, and if you have a, a takeaway to share uh, as we end the session, that would be great. Let's see. And, and, and looks like we may not. A bit of technical difficulty. <laughs> right, right. So, so I, I, well, thank you for po posting the, the, the link. And um, my, my, uh, my giveaway for everybody is that the world we live in now uh, ha has been designed piece by piece uh, by a series of choices, some very conscious, some not so conscious. Uh, and now we can have the opportunity to make much more conscious choices to create the world they want. And I would argue that circularity is basically the foundation of that, uh, as long as we uh, consider uh, the uh, other uh, objectives we have in terms of social uh, equity uh, and making sure we do the best uh, for the planet. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today.